My name is Jonathan Katz. I'm a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And the German Marshall Fund uh, has a number of offices across Europe, uh, including one office that actually provides grants uh, to civil society and other organizations in Ukraine. And we've been doing that for over a decade. Uh, prior to uh, joining the German Marshall Fund, I was in the US government. Uh, I was the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Europe and Eurasia uh, at USAID, overseeing, in part, uh, the USAID's programs in Ukraine. And, uh, and that was from 2014, shortly after the Maidan, uh, April 2014, all the way to January of 2017. So one, I'm really pleased to be here. I want to thank the US Ukraine Foundation. Uh, and I've heard the speakers earlier today and sort of the list of people who have come through. Um, and I think it's a testament to their effort and work, both in Washington, uh, but also in Ukraine, to have uh, brought us all together, experts that care deeply about US Ukraine relations, but also about Ukraine's future and the transatlantic community. And so, uh, I am lucky and greatly appreciated the opportunity to uh, co-chair uh, the Civil Society and Democracy Task Force with my colleague Orest, who many of you know as well uh, and have known for many years. Orest is going to be coming up shortly to speak as well. Um, and I think when I think about uh, democracy and civil society uh, in Ukraine and about the work that's been done by many of you Ukrainian citizens over the last five years, and by the government, we know that there's been uh, important progress made. Uh, we also know that there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, and our task force uh, has been looking at ways in which we can continue to support important reforms uh, in Ukraine, uh, even during a period of transition. And I think, as all of you know, I think there's something happening in about a week and a half in Ukraine an election, and then also in October as well. So the Friends of Ukraine Network um, has been deeply involved over the last several months, including our task force, um, in launching something called the Transatlantic Task Force for Democracy and Civil Society in Ukraine. And we've done this directly with Ukrainian civil society organizations, a number of them which you may know um, that are not only in Kiev, but also outside, but also in Brussels as well. Because when we start to think about what needs to be done in Ukraine, it's done first and foremost by Ukrainians on the ground, but it's usually done in support with international partners like the United States, the European Union, uh, World Banks like the World Bank, IMF, and others that have been playing a, a really important role over the last several years helping Ukraine move forward. So today we're going to talk about a series of recommendations that we have that Orest, I, and members of our task force, um, we're representing a number of people from a number of different uh, individuals, but also organizations. Um, of course, our task force recommendations are some that not everybody agrees with all of them, but we came together to, I think, really address some of the key issues in Ukraine, many of which you know quite well, uh, whether it's fight against corruption, making certain that there are free and fair and transparent elections. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there's been success already. Uh, but when you look at the polling numbers today, as many of you know, uh, there's deep concerns about the direction of the country not only about passing reforms, which we talk a lot about, but implementing reforms. So our recommendations really focus on, on sort of the United States, uh, what we think the US should be asking Ukraine to do, but also advocating for assistance levels to increase to meet the challenge. And I think during an election uh, season, it's particularly important for the United States and partners of Ukraine. Uh, I know my colleagues who spoke earlier about security. Not only do you have security challenges, but you have this democracy and governance challenge. And so it's really important that the United States and partners speak up and, uh, and express their strong support. And I saw that already in terms of sort of congressional resolutions, and legislation, which Oris knows about. We both worked on the Hill as well. And so we both played a role here, too, for many years, um, or even more so than myself, at supporting Ukraine's transition 
and sort of end its future in the Euro-Atlantic uh, community. One last thing is that we will both be going out to Ukraine uh, next week uh, as observers. Uh, Oris will be with the OSCE. Um, I'll be with NDI, uh, National Democratic Institute. And so we're going to be there on the ground observing the election, uh, writing about it. And when we come back, um, based on our commitment and that of the U.S. Ukraine Foundation, we're going to continue to work with the Ukrainian civil society, um, also work with our partners uh, both in Kiev. We've also expanded our task force to include counterparts in Ottawa and Canada as well. And uh, we will continue to work um, all the way through the election, parliamentary elections, to ensure that there's a spotlight and a focus in Washington uh, on Ukraine, on reforms, uh, which Oris will go uh, into more deeply in terms of our recommendations. And we just appreciate that you came here to, to listen to us. And um, I had an opportunity to hear the energy and economic uh, panel, and then also the security panel. I think you get a sense that there is a depth, great depth of, of understanding and information uh, here in Washington. But your being here is really important to helping us build a better understanding of what's needed by Ukrainians for Ukraine. And, and I'll just end with this. Uh, democracy is, and a democratic future of Ukraine is just as important as the security aspect is of dealing with Russia. And you hear this frequently from Ukrainian politicians running. They know it as well. But putting democracy into practice is a long and difficult process. Um, and addressing uh, what's been a, a challenge for many years, corruption is going to take the effort of Ukrainians and their international partners and hopefully we'll see a future where Ukraine will be in the EU, uh, and hopefully, uh, if Ukrainians want to, as a member of NATO. Oris, if I could just turn it to you to, to kick us off, and then we, we welcome your questions, uh, and just again, thank you for, for the opportunity to be here. Let me jump right into our task force recommendations. Now, I don't expect you to read them right away. There are a lot of them. They're very long. I admit, maybe even too long, but we try to fit in everything. We could have made them even longer, but, you know, so, uh, but rather than go through them, let me talk a little bit more about the why rather than the what, uh, although I'll touch upon the what. First of all, we have specific recommendations regarding the United States. Most of these deal with political support and financial assistance. Now, much has been done in terms of U.S. support and assistance for Ukraine since independence, especially in the last five years. Clearly, the U.S. is the major contributor to Ukraine's uh, military and security assistance. Um, and this is, of course, key, but also along with the EU and other international partners for democratic development, including funding for things like the rule of law and anti-corruption, independent judiciary, civil society, very importantly, um, independent media and whatnot. And all of these are essential for Ukraine uh, to become a successful Western-style European, genuine European democracy. Now, substantial funding for Ukraine does continue despite attempts, <laughs> frankly, by this administration last year to seriously curtail international assistance funding, which thankfully was pushed back, was sort of defeated by both Democrats and Republicans in Congress. Congress did not agree with these aid cuts. Um, and the president's latest budget again calls for substantial cuts in State Department international assistance accounts, which could also affect funding for Ukraine. And my hope and expectation is that there will again be bipartisan pushback from the Hill, from Congress, uh, so that Ukrainian Ukraine does get the assistance uh, it deserves, not only in the security field, but also in the critical areas of democracy, civil society, not to mention health, you know, the environment, agriculture, and all the other things that the U.S. Uh, assists Ukraine with. Um, now, our task force also, very importantly, makes recommendations for the Ukrainian side as well focusing on elections, civil society, the rule of law, and corruption. And let me zero in a little on corruption. We all know that endemic corruption and lack of rule of law has plagued Ukraine since independence. It's made it vulnerable to Russia. No country has benefited more, 
and I include Cyprus. Russia has benefited more, not only economically, from Ukraine's weakness in rule of law. And in addition to its other debilitating effects, including, I think, weakening the, the moral fabric of society and distorting Ukraine's economic life, Corruption is also very much a national security issue, and that sometimes gets lost on some people, I think. And despite some important achievements in, in my done in combating it, corruption does remain Ukraine's greatest internal enemy. Now, a slight digression about the term security. People sometimes tend to think of security as meaning just the military aspect, but this is an incomplete definition. And in fact, the OSC, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which when I was with the Health State Commission, we, we kind of work with them a lot. Um, doesn't mean we were a part of them, and we sometimes would even criticize them because we were US government, but we did work with them a lot. But they have a comprehensive notion of security, which is based on its seminal founding document called the 1975 Helsinki Final Act, which integrated human rights and fundamental freedoms into the broader notion of, of security. And at that time, that was kind of revolutionary. This, so this definition encompasses not only the political military aspects of security, but also the economic and environmental, and also something that's called the human dimension. And that means human rights and fundamental freedoms, democracy, rule of law, independent judiciary. All of these three dimensions are deeply intertwined. And more broadly, um, they are all matter not only for Ukraine's security, but for the security of the entire 57 country OSCE region. And in fact, our three FOUN, Friends of Ukraine Network task forces, if you think about it, broadly reflect these three dimensions of security. <clears throat> so tying it back to corruption, downplaying corruption, which has so harmed Ukraine's national security, serves, I think, neither the interests of the Ukrainian state or nor the Ukrainian people. Well, maybe it serves the interests of the elites, but we shouldn't conflate Ukraine's elites with the Ukrainian people. Um, and while there have been, I think, some significant improvements in the fight against the scourge of corruption, I'm not one in the camp that says that nothing's been done for the last five years, even in terms, in terms of reforms or even in terms of anti-corruption reforms, because progress has been made, but I, it's nowhere near enough. So our recommendations try to address that as well, issues relating to corruption. Adding our voice to, frankly, the US government, just think back if any of you read Ambassador Masha Yovanovitch's speech from a few weeks ago that she delivered, which I kind of call tough love, uh, which she addresses corruption, right? Um, and our partners, international community, and what civil society has been talking about. You know, who we work with Jonathan. I don't know if you mentioned it in Kiev when we have these international video conferences of our transatlantic task force uh, on elections and civil society in Ukraine is RPR, which many of you are familiar with. Ranyamatsini Paket Reform which is the largest sort of pro-reform, as we understand it, NGO coalition, <laughs> encompassing some over 80 NGOs. Um, now, I do want to caution our recommendation for Ukraine should not be interpreted as any endorsement or referendum on President Poroshenko, OK? Um, because again, I think the current leadership has made progress on reforms. Um, including anti-corruption reforms, even though many Ukrainians don't necessarily see it that way. Um, and perhaps that's reflected in his not so high poll numbers. Um, I'm not sure anybody else, if they, when the elections could necessarily do better. Uh, but unquestionably, uh, there's still a lot to be done. For example, when we address this in, the, in, in our recommendations, the anti-corruption institutions and architecture created in the last five years, they definitely need to be strengthened. They need to become more effective and they need to become more independent from outside politics and political interference. You know? And I think all of you know this, um, you know, 
uh, we could go through the list of all of the different anti-corruption institutions, but and that's addressed a little bit in the, when we drill down and in the recommendations. Bottom line is, regardless who wins the presidency or what what the composition of the Verkhovnarada will be in October, or what a new government might look like. Um, there's plenty of work ahead, there's plenty of room for progress, and this is a process, and it will be going on for years to come. And Ukraine's international partners all need to keep encouraging forward movement, including sometimes perhaps through the use of conditionality. Um, as for the elections, and I'll kind of conclude on this, our rec recommendations also address these. Yes, outcome's important. That's what everybody's paying attention to, understandably, uh, for obvious reasons, you know. Uh, uh, that, yeah, because the outcome matters, obviously, but it's not just about the outcome. It's also about the process. It's about ensuring that these elections meet international democratic standards, that the conduct of the elections is relatively free, fair, open and transparent, and that it reflects the will of the people. Um, the elections are very messy. This is not a phenomenon unique to Ukraine. Every day seems to bring new allegations and accusations of dirty tricks and scandals of vote buying and defense procurement corruption and whatnot. Um, and it's been very disappointing, I think, that serious electoral reform that has been sitting in the Rada for a number of years that not much has happened with that. But nevertheless, it's essential that these elections be conducted well. Uh, this is key to Ukraine's democracy and hence to its security. Think back to that broader notion of security we discussed. Um, and I'll just quote something that the head of the OSC Parliamentary Assembly uh, George Tseretelli said in Kiev a few weeks ago, because I think it sums it up perfectly when it comes to elections, and that is holding a competitive, peaceful, and well-administered election is vital to advance the democratic development of Ukraine and promote stability and security in the OSCE region. Thanks. Thank you. Is there, okay, we have a question in the back. I was in Ukraine, um, in, in January, and I spent time with um, a big um, kind of cross spectrum of people, including um, time with the uh, military. I didn't ask them as a journalist questions um, about how they were going to vote, but they volunteered um, a lot of information themselves. And out of the three kind of leading um, presidential candidates, um, they made it clear that even though um, they may not um, like uh, may not be in love with Poroshenko, that out of the three, um, at least um, he'd done something for the army and he'd visited them and the two others hadn't uh, visited them. I've also been watching um, what's been happening with um, um, uh, the Ministry of um, Interior, the links between them and the Azov Battalion and the Azov Battalion's Nuts um, corpus and, and, and the kind of language that's been used. Do you think that there's a danger, and this is now my question, that this will be the first Ukrainian elections after independence where a peaceful transfer of, of um, power might not go without a hitch? I don't know where there'll be the, the, the case, but you know, it's not irrational to think that there are dangers lurking ahead, and part of that is um, also because of Russian interference. And we don't know what will happen yet. Um, well, it's already happening. There is interference. When I talk about you know Ukraine having democratic elections and looking at the process, I was kind of thinking more also about what Ukraine can control itself, you know. Um, Russia's malign influence could, could be a problem. You can't exclude that possibility. Hopefully, um, Ukrainian society and government will be resilient enough to uh, combat it. Um, but so. Can I uh, answer that too? One, I think that what Oris said earlier about uh, uh, meeting 
uh, certain international standards for this election is, I think that's particularly important for, you know, for, for all of Ukrainians to see that the election is conducted in a free and fair and transparent manner um, and which there'll be election observers on the ground as well uh, from uh, both the OSCE, a number of other organizations, including NDI and IRI. So I, I think that that is critically important. What I thought you were asking maybe is, you know, will, could Ukraine be tested after the election, after a presidential election? And, and certainly um, the playbook, the Russian playbook, a Kremlin playbook, is consistently pushing and probing. Um, so, uh, and I'm sure they have a, you know, they are looking at the candidates and uh, looking at their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so there's a possibility that they'll probe after, depending on, you know, depending on what takes place um, in the election. Um, and there's certainly those candidates that are better known uh, than others to Western partners, uh, but it's going to be up to the Ukrainian public to vote. And as a former U.S. government official, um, we, you know, the United States doesn't determine who's going to be the next uh, president. That's going to be up to the Ukrainian people. But my suggestion is for U.S. officials and partners of Ukraine is to pay close attention to the outcome of the election and pay close attention to the security atmosphere and other things that could happen post-election and be ready to engage and support Ukraine regardless of who ends up as uh, the next president of Ukraine. In addition, you have parliamentary elections as well. So these so un undoubtedly, these elections are going to put a put Ukrainian politics possibly in some sort of a, a really real commotion and real changes. And so you have a, several months until the parliamentary elections, all of which will be a period of potential instability. Um, but but it's hard to predict. But I think most important is that you know partners and Ukrainians and others are, need to think about this period as well. And it's hard to do it when you're right before an election. But I've talked to a number of U.S. officials about the day after and about being prepared and also sending strong signals uh, of continued uh, support and engagement. I don't know if that necessarily answers the question, but I think, it, I, think there's, I think there's certainly a moment of, a potential moment of uncertainty.